You know, I would like to amplify on one thing that Greg said, and one of the most consistent comments that we get from people who come here, and one that probably blesses me the most when you ask them what's happened, people just fall in love with the Lord. It's like they develop a personal relationship with the Lord. And it's not to say that they didn't know him before, but they know him in a greater way. And you know, this is what it's all about. Um, I've, I've met people that are excited about, you know, a movement, about things that are going on. There is a lot of excitement when you come here and hear the praise and worship and and none of that is to be denied, but man, you know, it's all those things are going to be gone someday. But Jesus, if you ever get plugged in and get to where you know him personally and get to where you have a relationship with him, I guarantee you that's, that's, that'll take you through anything. And that's what it's all about. You know, in uh, Hebrews 8.10, it says that they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know him from the least to the greatest. And that's talking about our new covenant and it's contrasting with the old covenant. In the old covenant, people didn't have this personal relationship with God. They didn't have God living in them. And so in a sense, they were following the instructions of other people and following principles and rules and regulations. And, but in the new covenant, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come live with you. I will be with you. He left the Holy Spirit. And there is just a huge difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And anyway, this is what we're doing here. We're making disciples. I really believe that one of the shortcomings of the church is that they have been making converts. They tell people about their need for the Lord. They tell them how to be born again. And there are lots of people that get born again. But Jesus gave us a command to go into all the world and make disciples and teach them to observe all things. And most Christians, uh, again, this is a broad statement, but most Christians around the world, they may know about God, but they don't have this intimacy. They aren't a disciple. A disciple is a person who can go out and reproduce his faith, who is walking in victory. Matter of fact, Jesus said this in the eighth chapter of, the John, of John. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Some people will take that 32nd verse and just say, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But it only comes if you continue in the word and become a disciple. A disciple means a person who is a learner. And uh, just so, too many Christians stop too close to the front gate. The, the front door. They just barely get inside. If they die, they would go to be with the Lord. But if they were arrested for being a Christian, there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict them. And we're making disciples. That's what the Lord called us to do. And I believe it's already having a profound impact. We've met with kings and presidents of other nations. We are impacting other nations. And great things are happening. And it's just because of the word of God giving us an accurate representation of who God is, and then everybody beginning to have their own personal relationship. It's awesome. So if you desire any of those things, this is the place for you. Amen? That's awesome. You know, we're going to receive an offering, and I want to give you an opportunity to give tonight. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want to use just one verse here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, all of chapter 8 and chapter 9 is talking about giving. And it, ta it starts talking about how poor the people were, and yet they were liberal and they abounded to all of this, uh, uh, you know, abundance. And yet it talks about them being poor. And, and so anyway, it's some great things said here. In chapter 9, in verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Boy, this is a huge statement. This is a big statement. This is saying that you always, not just sometimes, not every once in a while, but you always, you can go ahead and pass out the offering envelopes if you want to, give by a credit card or if you want a cash gift and get a tax deductible receipt you can fill that out in English not in tongues and we'll give you a receipt 
But he said he would always make us abound. And what is the purpose of all of it? Right here at the end of this eighth verse, it says, these things are done so that you may abound to every good work. Did you know that the real reason that God prospers us is not just so that our needs can be met. Now, I am not saying that God doesn't meet our needs. He does meet our needs. He said he'd meet all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God does love us, and he wants every one of us to prosper. But just like he told Abraham, he says, I will, make you gr I will bless you and make your name great, and I will make you a blessing. Genesis 12:3. The real purpose of prosperity isn't so that you can just consume it upon yourself, but it's so that you can be a blessing. And this is why God blesses us, is to be a blessing. In a sense, this is a biblical definition of what real prosperity is. You know what prosperity is? It's not whether you have a big house, a big car, whether you have lots of jewels, whether you have fancy clothes, whether you drive a nice car and all these kind of things. God's definition of prosperity is having enough to abound to every good work. I've had a lot of people that were considered rich in the world system and they were millionaires on paper, but they don't have anything to give. Everything's all tied up. It's all invested. Everything is leveraged. And they look at this and they think that this is rich. Did you know God considers a person rich who abounds to every good work? And some people might listen to what I'm saying, saying, well, if you did that, you'd never have anything. That's what you would think, but because there is a God who said, Luke 6, 38, when you give, it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Because there is a God who made that promise, it's just the opposite of what you think. When you start living to give, when you just want to bless other people and stuff, God will bless you so that you don't have room enough to receive. That is absolutely true. You know, my wife and I started out so poor, we couldn't pay attention. And I mean, we struggled. Eight months pregnant, Jamie was, and we went two weeks without any food because we didn't have anything. And we've been through a lot of poverty. But you know what? We have now given away, I don't even know, but probably a hundred million books, CDs, DVDs. I'm counting our internet stuff. We, everything there is available free. We've given away hundreds of millions of things. 53% of the people that contact our ministry don't have a penny. And they say, could we have it free? And we give the majority of all of our stuff away. And you know what? God's blessed us. Everything you see is debt free. God's prospered us. And it's, it works. If you will live to give, God will bless you. And so tonight, we're going to give you an opportunity to give and be a part of what we're doing. Everything we're building here is debt-free. We've got this second building going up. We've already spent, man, I forget. I think it's either 18 or $20 million on that. And um, we had to slow down our construction on it because I ran out of money in December. But we've started back up. This is just a little construction update for those of you that want to know. And uh, the city has given us, I'm not sure if it's final, they've given us tentative approval and I think it's just about done to finish out the upstairs north and east side of this building because we were running out of office space. I don't have an office in this building. <laughs> I got kicked out today so Paul could meet with somebody and I was, I'm in the green room back here where we put the speakers and I don't have an office and we, lots of people don't have offices. We've spent We've sent about 20 or more people, I think, down to the springs. We have 250 employees down there and 100 and something up here. So we were going to have to go rent a space for that. We were having to get a place to put our uh, phone center because 95% uh, of the people that answer our phones are Bible college students. And one of our peak call times is right after the Daystar broadcast, and that starts at 650 and goes till 7.50 and our students have to leave at 7 from Colorado Springs to come up here. So we were dropping four to 5,000 calls a month. So we were gonna rent a space and put a call center up here so that our students wouldn't have to travel so far and we could capture those calls. 
And anyway, we just decided to go ahead and finish out just a portion of this building. And so it's a $6 million uh, project to finish that out. We've got it scheduled to be through by um, July the 31st and move in in August. And all of that's on, on tap. But, and I'm premature, I won't give you all the details. God had just impressed it on me that we need to get that building and our parking garage done by July of 2017. Because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. I think we're anticipating a thousand people at the rate things are going for this year, and that will literally max out this facility. So that'll go for the 16 and 17 school year. And if we grow at the same pace in 2017, we've already talked about possibly having to take third year and put them down in the springs and use live streaming, which is not acceptable to me. And so I'm just believing God for a miracle. And what I need, what I need is 100,000 people that would give us a dollar a day, and that's no big deal. We have millions and millions of people that are exposed to my program and stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, 100,000 people giving $30 a month would be $3 million a month. That's what I need to get these two buildings done in the next 15, 16 months. And also, let me just mention this. I had a guy yesterday give me this Rolex watch. He, it's, he said he paid 14000 for it and he wanted to put it into the building. And you know what? This building doesn't need this Rolex watch. What we need is the cash. So I'm asking if anybody won't, if you would not buy a Rolex watch, but you would give $14,000 to our building program, we'll give this to you for $14,000. What a deal, amen. I wouldn't go spend 14,000 on a Rolex, but you know what? I would put 14, I, I do put $14,000 into this building program. And so this is a way to get blessed back. So uh, I tell you what, uh, Ashley, I'm gonna let you keep this because I'm not always around and Ashley will have this. And if anybody would like to uh, buy that for $14,000, Ashley will give it to you. 15,000, right. you may have to barter with them, amen. Ashley's quite the businessman. No telling what we'll get for that. <laughs> Praise God. But I'd like to encourage you tonight to sow into this. And you know, we don't charge our students for this. All of the money that comes in in tuition is just to run the school. I don't even know. We have a hundred or close to a hundred employees right here. And then there's a lot of uh, expense to running this campus and all of the things we do. So all of the tuition goes towards the school. Our students don't pay for this at all. Our partners have paid for everything that you see and um, we would like to ask you to just be a part of it. Amen. And if you aren't a part of it, you need to be. And if you are, thank you for being a part of it. Amen. And you could be a bigger part if you'd like. So let's pray over this and then we're going to receive this offering. Father, we love you and we are so thankful for everything you've done for us. Father, thank you for making all grace abound towards us so that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, can abound unto every good work. Thank you for our blessing, our prosperity. And Father, tonight we just receive it. And I'm asking that you touch your people here, that you would impress on them, have them channel some of their blessing and prosperity towards building these buildings so we can keep expanding Karis and get things done. And Father, we thank you. I believe that as people do that, that like 2 Corinthians 9 10 says, that you will give grace, you will give seed to the sower, and that they will have an abundance so that they can abound to every good work. So we agree and receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, you can receive the offering. You know, I didn't ask our uh, audiovisual people back there, but do you guys have the uh, tour of phase two? We aren't going to be able to take you in there. It's an active construction site. So if you've got that virtual tour, this was done two or three years ago, but it's based on our uh, drawings that we have. And it's uh, an idea. The furniture is going to be different. This is just uh, to show you, uh, to hold places and show you what we got. We're going to have a lot nicer furniture than what's in this uh, virtual tour. But I'd like to show this. And I think I'll narrate it unless you show the version that I am narrating. All right, so these are our two buildings here. 
This is entering into the new one that you see under construction. And um, this, this building right here is 70,000 square feet, I think. And th this building is 150,000 square feet. So it's over twice as big. The parking garage that will be on the north side of this building will be 336,000 square feet, or five times the size of this building, two and a half times the size of that other building. And down here, this is a, uh, what we're calling the concourse right now, and this has tables, chairs, we're gonna put sofas in there, and this is a break area for the students in between classes and things like that. And so downstairs and upstairs, there will be this break area. This is a water feature that you're gonna see, a two-story waterfall. Uh, there will be a real neat feature uh, in there. And upstairs also, you can see we have tables and chairs all across there. And we got the best view of Pikes Peak right out there. It's awesome. We're going to have to have hall monitors that force the students to come into class, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's going to be awesome. It's a beautiful place. And then this will enter into the auditorium. We've expanded this from our original plan of 2,500 seats to now it's right at 3,200. I think it's uh, 3,180 or something like that. But this gives you an idea of what the auditorium will look like. We'll have a big stage here. We've got three big screens up there so that wherever you're sitting in the auditorium, you'll have a good view. There's a screen on the back so the people on the platform will be able to see what's going on. And then, uh, this doesn't give a tour of it, but on the other side, on, that si on the other side of that wall right there that you see, and then on the other side of this wall that's on the left, on the left will be our phone center, on the other side will be our offices, and we will have uh, room, I think that the first stage that we build will be uh, 30 or 35 fixed offices, 35 uh, cubicles and then downstairs we also have another place to expand maybe another 30 to 40 offices and so it'll give us uh, probably a, a, at least a hundred offices in addition to what we already have here and then in that phone center we're going to be able to we won't do this immediately because we're still between two buildings but we will put we will have a, the eventual ability to put 150 people answering the phones at one time out on the main floor and then if you use all of the other offices and training rooms we could do even more than that right now we are averaging over 30,000 calls a month we just added 18 new television stations uh, last week matter of fact they haven't started broadcasting yet but we've added 18 more major markets and we are negotiating to go on uh, in the evening. Most of my programs, I only have two programs that are on in prime time. Most of them are in the morning. And so we're negotiating with uh, Daystar. We were that close to being on Daystar in the evening and we're negotiating. And once we do that, it's a whole new audience and we are looking to double, triple the number of people that we're reaching. We're doing a lot of other things. So, man, we're planning for big growth. And, uh, Thank you for being a part of it. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. I'm gonna start here, I'm not gonna stay here, but these are the first verses that the Lord ever spoke to me. I mean, I read a lot of verses, I memorized scripture when I was a kid, but the first time that the Lord ever just nailed me and spoke to me was Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, and it was the Christmas of 1967 and the Lord said, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And for 18 months before this, I had been seeking God's will for my life. I really believe, and I was taught this, and I believed it, and I still believe it, that we aren't an accident. It's not, we didn't just happen. We are created by God with the purpose. And I believe that you don't just do your thing and ask God to bless it, but you find out what God created you for. 
And so until I was in high school, I really didn't have to think much about what God's will for my life was because I had it planned out. I knew I had to go through high school and stuff. But when you got into high school, they started, you know, having career days and talking about what are you going to do with your life. And since I did believe that God had a purpose for me, I got to seeking it. For 18 months, I was just desperate seeking the will of the Lord. I stayed up until 2 or 3 o'clock every night of my high school uh, reading the Bible. I, I asked people, how do you know God's will? How do you find God's will? And nobody could tell me. And many, much of the stuff that they said was basically that God just makes it come to pass. You, he just sovereignly moves in your life. And yet, I saw so many people that were failures and having hard uh, times, and I knew that that wasn't God's will for their life. I just couldn't believe that things just, you know, whatever happens, it had to be God's will. So I was uh, on a quest to find God's will, and nobody could tell me. I just started reading the Bible, and that prepared my heart and made me receptive, but when I heard those verses in Christmas of 1967, that last phrase, you do this, you will prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Man, my ears perked up and I said, this is it. This is my, this is my answer. And so from Christmas of 67 until March the 23rd, 1968, all I did was read these verses and say, what does it mean? And I happen to have an awesome teaching on this entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. I'm not going to teach on that tonight. But the reason I bring this up is to say I believe that that's why you're here. Is that you know that there's something more. You're praying and you're asking God for direction. And what does God want you to do with your life? That's what grabbed my attention and caused me to have this miraculous encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968. And I tell you, God transformed my life. And uh, I know that many of you are in that same place. And until you know, I mean not just pray and then do your own thing and hope that it's what God wants and stuff, but until you have a direction from God. In my life, God's will does not come to pass automatically. You have to get a vision and you have to pursue you know, when Sharon, was it Sharon? She says I know her name. Sharon. All right. When Sharon was talking and stuff, you, you have to know God's will. It doesn't come to pass. And like she was sharing, she made the decision to come here. But then there's a lot of things that didn't work. And there's so many people that the way they discern God's will, they ask for fleece. They say, God, if you want me to do this, then make one dog walk across the street this way and two cats this direction. Or, you know, and this is the way that they find God's will. That is not a good way to discern God's will. Matter of fact, I say it this way. If you look in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul had been just going everywhere. And if you follow his missionary journey, if you diagram it, Paul just systematically covered every place. He was going everywhere preaching the gospel. And he tried to go into Bithynia and the Lord wouldn't let him. Then he tried to go here and the Lord wouldn't let him. He tried to go another place and the Lord wouldn't let him. You know what that says? That he was going places that God didn't necessarily direct him to go. God had to stop him. Most people think that you just pray and wait until God gives you all of these things. He was just taking the word that says go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he, he, instead of sitting at a red light waiting for a green light, he assumed he had a green light and he was going for it. But he was sensitive to God when God said, no, don't go here. And finally, in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, he had a vision. And the Lord showed him a man in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And so he woke up the next morning and he said he knew that God had sent him to Macedonia. And so until he got a specific word, he was just taking the general word that God gave all of us about going to all the world and make disciples. But when he got a specific word from God, it says that he woke up and headed immediately into Macedonia. He went to Philippi. And did you know within 48 hours he had been beaten and put in jail? And most people would think, oh, I thought I heard from God. He did hear from God. And yet he had all kinds of problems. I'm telling you, if you are letting circumstances dictate to you, we live in a fallen world. The vast majority of people are not being led by God. 
And there is opposition. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you don't run into opposition, you aren't living godly. If the whole world is headed to hell, if you turn around and start going for God, you are going to face opposition. It's like swimming upstream. If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. You turn around and start going for God, and that doesn't guarantee that everything's going to be okay. There will be opposition, but God does guarantee that if you don't quit and stay with it, you'll win. You'll overcome. I've had a lot of opposition. I've had a lot of things come against me, but you know what? I'm winning because I just stuck with it, and God will bring you through. So anyway, what I'm saying is that many people just kind of hope that God's leading them. They let circumstances, they go with whatever is the easiest on them. I'm telling you, that is a recipe for disaster. If you want to prosper, you've got to find out what God created you for, and then you just go in that direction. If it hair lips the devil, if it causes all kinds of problems, you heard Sharon talking about her family. She had to tell them, I've heard from God. Jesus said, you know, that a man's foes will be though of his own house. He'll be honored and accepted anywhere except in his own town and among his own house and among his own kin. I'm telling you, if you just let circumstances dictate you, you'll miss God's will for your life. What I'm doing is I know what God called me to do, but it wasn't an easy road to get here, amen. I've been through some stuff. And everybody, you could talk about Greg Moore. I've known him for 20 or 30 years. I've seen them go through some stuff. I remember when he came to our minister's conference and was under an $11 million lawsuit. And man, stressed out. And he got set free, drunk as a skunk. And he got set free. And you know what? He survived. He's still alive and he's prosperous. Amen. And you could just talk. I know Daniel here and Daniel's gone through some things with his family. He's been out of the ministry. Uh, it hasn't been easy. It's not easy. Satan is going to fight against you. And you have to have a word from God. Know what God's will is. And then you have to pursue it. If you don't pursue it, you won't get it. If you just say, oh God, what's your will and try and head in a direction. And if it's going to be easy, then you assume that that's God's will. But if it's hard, you must have missed God. You will miss God. Absolutely. Let me just share a few verses with you. I'm wanting to get on to some other things, but I got to lay a foundation for this. Look over here in Galatians chapter one. This is the apostle Paul speaking. And you know what? I think the apostle Paul found God's will for his life. I think he was very successful. And look at what he said here. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 15, I'm going to break right into the middle of what he was saying, but he says in verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, etc. But right here in this 15th verse, he says that God called him from his mother's womb and separated him unto the gospel. And this reveals a tremendous truth. And that is that you were called and created by God before you were ever born. There's a lot of people that think that somehow or another, you know, God just wound creation up and it's like a clock and it runs without his intervention and you were just born and maybe your parents didn't know you were coming. Maybe you were a mistake and you just never have felt like you were special or anything. Man, that's not so. You were created by God. And while you were still in your mother's womb, you were called and separated by God. And you've only got one chance to reach your full potential. And it's not up to you to pick and choose and do your own thing and then ask God to bless it. You got to find out what it was that God called you for and separated you for. Here's another verse that goes along with this. In Jeremiah chapter 1, I had an encounter with the Lord in 1973, January of 1973, where God showed up and I laid on the floor for hours just in the presence of God saying, God, what are you doing? And the Lord spoke these exact verses to me. So these are personal for me, but they're personal for everybody. The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. So if he, if he did this for Paul, if Paul was called and separated, 
And if Jeremiah was called and separated from his mother's womb, this isn't unique just to two people. God applied it to me. I've applied it in my life. And it's the same for every single one of you. Right here in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Man, that's, that's awesome. Did you know God doesn't look around and say, oh, well, this person, man, you are really good with accounting. And this person, you've got a talent to sing. And this person, you are just an entrepreneur. You're a visionary. And he looks at you and chooses you based on your talents and abilities. Before you were ever born, before you had ever developed, before you had ever done anything, God had a purpose for you. He created you on purpose. Everything about you, whether you're a man or a woman, what color your skin is, where you were born, everything about you is created and designed by God to fulfill a purpose. Now that can be uh, perverted. I don't believe anybody raised, uh, God created anybody to be an alcoholic, a drunk, uh, you know, to be a murderer and all of these things. And, and it's obvious that people are all of those things. So you have a choice. It says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, he says, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you the choice. But even though you can choose and he doesn't force this plan upon you, God has a plan for your life. And everything about you was created to fulfill this plan. And nothing else is going to satisfy you and make you happy. And even if you have multi-talents and if you could prosper outside of God's perfect will for your life, you'll never prosper to the degree that you could if you would find what God created you to do. So I'm saying all of these things to say that you were created by God for a specific purpose and you have to find out what that purpose is. And you know, I minister on this lots of different times and often I will have people stand if they aren't sure that they know what God has called them to do. Maybe they love God, maybe they're living for God the best they know how, they're asking God to bless what they're doing, but they don't know for sure that they are doing what God has called them to do. And when I give an invitation like that, 80 to 90% of most churches will stand and say that they don't know for sure, they're just assuming so. I'm telling you, you will not fulfill God's will accidentally. It doesn't come to pass without effort. You have to get a vision and you have to pursue it. If you want to go from here to New York, you better find out what direction that is, what roads to take. You have to look at a map and you have to make choices and you have to follow a plan. If you don't, you know, if you just head out and say, well, it doesn't matter which direction I go. I think I'll go this way. You aren't going to wind up in New York. Amen. For those of you that are directional challenged, New York is over that way. <laughs> Amen. And you know what? If you don't have any place in mind, well, then any old road will do. But if you have, if you have some place you have to go, you have to plan how to get there. And God has a plan for your life. He was created you for a purpose. And you've got to find out what that purpose is. And over in Ephesians chapter 5, let me just read this verse. In Ephesians chapter 5, um, in verse 17, he says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. In other words, this is a command. It's unwise not to know. This just amazes me. And I'm not saying these things to condemn anybody. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I am amazed that people will be 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. And they don't know what God created them for. That's unwise. And yet I'd say that this is typical. I'd say the vast majority of people do not have an understanding that they were created for something. Or they'll sometimes think, well, only you ministers have a call. But you know what? God has a purpose for every single person. Do you happen to have the NIV translation back there? Could you put that up? 
Yes. Turn over to Psalms 139. In, in the King James, this is real wordy, but I want to read this to you out of um, the NIV, the nearly inspired version. In Psalms 139, beginning with uh, verse 14. Could you put that up there so I could read that? I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Next verse. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. This says that before you were even in your mother's womb, God had already written all of your days out in his book. Now again, you have the choice whether to follow God's plan or to lean under your own plan. God doesn't force this on you, but God had a plan for every one of us before you were even born. And so I'm emphasizing this because the average person doesn't believe this. The average person thinks it's kind of up to you to pick and choose what's going on. You know, like in my situation, everybody in my family was a school teacher. And so when I started seeking the Lord before I had this encounter where the Lord revealed his purpose to me, uh, I was really good in math. And so I was going to major in math and be a school teacher just because those seemed to be things that I liked. Everybody else in my family was a teacher. And if the Lord hadn't have intervened, I'd have probably wound up being a school teacher like everybody else in my family. My father, my mother, my brother, my sister, my aunts, my uncles, all but one uncle. I had a professor at Berkeley that was an uncle. It was just what it was. And you know what? This is, life was just kind of pushing me in this direction. But God had a different purpose for me. And praise God that I found it. Man, I am so thankful that God has shown me what he created me for and what he's doing. And I'm telling you, every one of you, God has a purpose for your life. And you should not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. It's a command. God wants you to know his will for your life more than you want to know it. So again, I'm a... I'm going to recommend this teaching that I've got entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. If you don't have that, you owe it to yourself to get that. You can go to our website and get it free of charge and download it and listen to it in MP3. But you need to find those things out. What I want to do tonight is, in the rest of the time is just share three things with you that you can use to identify whether you really in God's will or not. And I can't find you one verse that says this. This is just based on my life experience walking with the Lord and things that God has spoken to me. The first thing is that if God calls, if you find God's will for your life, it's going to be beyond your ability. God will call you to do something that is uncomfortable to you. It's not your natural thing. And there's many reasons for this, but one of them is God wants to get you out of just walking in the natural and doing things by your own power. He wants to call you to do something that is impossible for you to do so that you have to trust in God. A scripture goes along with this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, where it says, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, are called. God has chosen the weak things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are, are, are not, and things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. And it goes on to say the reason he does it is so that no flesh will glory in his presence. God is going to call you to something that is bigger than you. Like in my case, I was an introvert. I couldn't look at a single person. I mean, one-on-one, talking to them and talk to a person and look at them in the face. Now, I could do it around family and friends, people that I was used to, but I'm saying if it was somebody I didn't know, I was a senior in high school and I was walking down the street and a man said, good morning. And he was two blocks down the street and I was sitting in my car and I finally said, good morning. <laughs> That's how messed up I was. I was an introvert standing in front of people and talking like this would have killed me. You couldn't have forced me to do this. 
And so I turn my life over and say, God, what did you call me for? And he wants me to speak to millions of people and be in front of large crowds. And I guarantee you, this is just not me. He called me to do something that I could not do. And God will call you to do something that you cannot do. And if you are doing things that are well under control and you can handle it, you got it from here, you've never found God's will for your life. God will call you to do something that is bigger than you. God is a big God. And I guarantee you, we are limiting him. And, you know, the Lord showed this to me back in 1968. And ever since then, he's just been stretching me and calling me to do things like build this campus. When we started this, I didn't have two pennies to rub together. And we've spent $50 million in the last seven years above our normal expenses. It was impossible. It could not be done. And it's done. It's being done. And it will be done. And you know, when God calls you to do something that's bigger than you, it makes you depend upon him. And that's one of the main reasons he does it. He wants to be involved in your life. He wants to flow through you. He doesn't want you to just do your thing and you be a nice person and you get the credit because you're just a nice person. He's going to lead you to do things that are so far beyond you that when people see you and see his power flowing through you, he will get the credit and it will bring glory to God. Anybody who knows me knows that uh, it's God what's going on in my life. You know, we have some employees that have been with me for 35 years or 30 years. And I was talking to one of them just last time we did television and we were talking about this and he remembers what it was like 30 years ago. And he says, man, this is God. It's God. My mother, right before she died, this was in 2009. She called me in and asked again that I'd tell her what the Lord was doing in the ministry. And I told her all these things overseas and everything. And she looked at me and she says, Andy, you know this is God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know this is God. And then she stuck that little bony finger right in my face and she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I tell you what, we just had a meeting with some investors and stuff at our lodge up here and people that do big things. I mean, billions of dollars of stuff. And... Uh, they were talking about our ministry and what's happening. And I said, I don't know what's happening. I said, I, it's God. I, and God has sent me these people. They know how to make it work. I, I'm like on a roller coaster, sitting on the front row, hanging on for dear life, amen. <laughs> it's God. Anyway, God will call you to do something that's bigger than you. If you are, you know, safe and if your life is just set and everything's cool and you can handle it from here. And if God doesn't show up, you're okay. You don't, you've not found God's will for your life. I guarantee you, God's going to stretch you. God's going to put you in some place where you have to depend upon him. Fruit grows out on the end of the limb, not on the trunk. You need to get out on a limb. You need to be out there swaying in the breeze thinking, oh God, if you don't come through, I've had it. And if, you're, if your life doesn't take any faith to operate in, if you're just doing what your unsaved neighbor does and everything's the same as people that don't know God, you've missed God. God's got something supernatural for you. Now, God's not going to call everybody to do what I'm doing. He may not put you in front of people, but he will stretch you. If nothing else, he told us the works that he did, he, we will do also. And you need to be out there raising your neighbors from the dead. Amen. And you need to believe in God for extra money so can you help me build these buildings and you can get the kingdom of God done. You need to be living beyond yourself. And if you aren't living beyond yourself, if everything you're doing is just natural, then you've missed God. And you know, one of the things that happens when God calls people to the Bible college, I was talking to someone tonight that they don't know how they're going to pay for this. They don't know what they're going to do. They said, this is going to be a walk of faith. That's one of the great things about coming to Bible college is because it is going to push you beyond yourself. If you're just waiting until God supplies all of the needs and everything is done so that you don't have to trust God and you can just come with no effort, you miss God again. 
God's going to call you to do something that's beyond yourself. So don't look to your wallet and stuff. I got a great teaching entitled A Place Called There. And that's in a series entitled Lessons from Elijah. I guarantee you, you ought to get that teaching on a place called there. That would change your life. I've seen thousands of people's lives change through that. And uh, you need to just do what God told you to do. I had a guy come to me one time and say, God told me to come to Bible college. And then he started telling me all of the problems. He had a family business that he was going to inherit. They were going to disinherit him if he came to Bible college. He had a fiance. She was going to break off the engagement if he came to Bible college. His church was going to excommunicate him. They thought that I was a cult and told him not to have anything to do with this. He was going to suffer financially. He didn't have a place to live. He didn't have a job here. He was from Chicago, all these things. And he spent 20 minutes telling me all of these things. And he says, so what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment God, you said God told you to come to Bible college. I said, if God told you to come to Bible college, just do it. Well, what about my bill? I said, just do it. What about this? Just do it. Man, I, don't, I do not debate. If God tells me to do something, I will do it. You know, if I would have sat down and thought real hard about all the stuff he's leading me to do here, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I knew that God spoke to me and I just decided, all right, we're going to do it. And you know what? We're in the process. And beyond this building, I got a vision of $180 million worth of building stuff that I'm going to do. And I don't know how it's going to get done, but it'll get done. We'll do it. Amen. So you just do it. If you are living a life that doesn't need a miracle from God, you don't need God's intervention. You've missed his will for your life. Most people are playing it too safe. And this is how they discern what they think is God's will. They'll look at things and if one is going to stretch you and one has potential failure and one is a little bit risky, they'll take the safe one every time and thinking this must be God's will. I would probably invert those things. If it doesn't take any faith, if everything's good, if you got all of your bases covered, I doubt if you heard from God. God's going to lead you to do something that's beyond yourself. The second thing that you can tell whether God, whether you're doing God's will or not is that it, is it what you love to do? You know, this is a surprise to a lot of people because a lot of Christians think that if you submit yourself to God, God's going to ask you to do all these terrible things that you don't want to do. I remember in the church that I grew up in, we used to sing, you know, I will follow Jesus wherever he leads, I'll go. And they would sing and they'd have the missionary come up and say, he told me to leave here and go to live in a grass hut in Africa. And I've been struggling and, and dealing with, and it was just struggle and struggle. And we associated following God with being bad. And it was going to be terrible. But you know, the scripture says in Psalms chapter 37, Verse 5, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that if you will delight yourself in the Lord, he'll just give you whatever you want. You can prove in scripture that that's not true. Some of you want a new wife, a new husband. That's not God's will for you, amen. Some of you want to win the lottery. God is not going to help you win the lottery. He does not fix stuff like that. You just ask him to put money in your bank account. That's crooked. It's counterfeit. God's not going to counterfeit United States currency. There's a lot of things that we want that God's not going to meet. This is not saying that he'll just give you whatever you want, but it's saying that if you delight yourself in the Lord, if God is the focus of your life, if you're putting first the kingdom of God, God will put his desires in your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He will put his desires in your heart. And this is one of the ways that God leads us. There's been many times in my life that God has supernaturally led me by just my desires. And it's wrong to think that your desires are always wrong. The church that I grew up in, they actually said that if you want to know God's will for your life, then pick what you want to do and do the exact opposite. And that's God. That's actually what they taught. And did you know that's correct if you don't love God and if you aren't serving God? Because the carnal mind is the enemy of God. It's not subject to the law of God. So if you aren't seeking God, that's a true statement. Your desires are not God's desires. But 
if you seek God and make him your delight, God will put his desires in your heart and you can actually do these desires if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, if you're seeking God. You know, when I was in um, Seagoville, Texas, pastoring a little church for two years, it was a hard time. And this is back during our poverty days. And we had a maximum attendance of 15. And most of the time it was five. But 15 was a big deal. And we struggled and it was bad. And people told me all the time, why don't you leave Seagoville, Texas and go somewhere where you're wanted? But you know what? I just loved Seagoville, Texas. I felt called to it and I was so excited about it. And people thought I was crazy, but I wanted to be there. And then one day I was down at the church praying and I was looking out the windows and I was praying for the people in Siva and I looked out the windows and I said, this is the worst place I've ever seen in my life. Why would anybody live here? And my love for Sigaville, Texas just evaporated. It was gone instantly and I hated it. I hated everything about it. I looked at the building that we had and I thought, this is terrible. And it was such a radical change that I thought, what is this all about? And I spent two hours praying in tongues and saying, God, what's going on? And finally, the Lord got it across to me. It's time for you to leave. And he told me, you'll leave November the 1st. He didn't tell me where I was going, but he said, you will be leaving November the 1st. And so I went home to tell Jamie that I don't know what happened, but God just told me our time's through. And when I got there, a for sale sign was in our front yard. And I went in and I, before I could even tell Jamie, I said, what happened? And she said, the landlord came by and said, you got to be out of here November the 1st. And I thought, well, that's God. And so we left. And you know what? That's one of the ways that God told me it was time to go because my desire, I didn't, all of a sudden my desires changed. There are some of you doing things that you don't enjoy. You may be one of those that you get up on Monday and talk about, oh man, I hate to go to work. I hate this job. I'm telling you, you either need to do one of two things. Either you aren't loving God with your whole heart and you're just carnal and that's the reason you don't like anything. Or if you really do love God and if you're seeking God, it could be that God has placed a holy dissatisfaction in you. This is one of the ways that he leads us. And I can tell you when I moved from Seagoville to Childers, Texas, I fell in love with Childers, Texas. And then all of a sudden, we were driving up here to hold a meeting in Colorado Springs and we drove through Pritchett, Colorado. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Pritchett, Colorado. Has anybody ever been to Pritchett, Colorado? A few of you. That girl that was from Cheyenne Wells, she might have been to Pritchett, Colorado. But anyway, if it's not the end of the world, you can see it from there. It's that small. It was 144 people. And we were driving to Colorado Springs. We drove through Pritchett and I was with Don and Wendy Crow. Jamie and I were with Don and Wendy Crow. And when we drove through that town, we looked at that and I said, who would live here? I said, this is, this is terrible. And I looked over at Don and started prophesying. And I said, Don, I believe God's calling you to Pritchett. I believe God wants you to live in Pritchett. And I was just giving him a hard time. It wasn't a month until I was living there. Long story, but I held a meeting there and we had a man raised from the dead. And the people came to me and said, you can't come here and hold a five day meeting and be gone. You've upset all of our theology and now you gotta come and stay and teach us. And I said, no way. I'm not staying in Pritchett, Colorado. And before I got out of town, which was two minutes, I knew I was coming back. And I fell in love with Pritchett. And this is how God directed me. Because I love God. God will put his desires in your heart. So I'm saying this, that you know, if you have a desire to come to Bible college, guess what? The devil didn't put it in your heart to come to Karis Bible College. It's not your flesh that wants to come and sit under the word four hours a day for two or three years. This is not the devil. I can guarantee you the devil doesn't speak these kind of things. If you've got a desire, why do you think it's there? It's because you've delighted yourself in the Lord. You've been seeking God and God is placing this desire in your heart. That doesn't mean that you don't have maybe some 
concerns about how am I going to do this and how does all this work out. But I mean, if you just have the desire. In my meetings, I'll often ask people, I said, how many of you, if you didn't have financial restraints, if you didn't have a job, if you didn't have family members, if you didn't have... Uh, you know, parents or something that you got to take care of. If you weren't worried about missing your retirement and just on and on and on it goes. We've had people before say, well, I got dogs. How can I come to Bible college? <laughs> they allow dogs out here. You could bring your dogs. And I'm not going to say the rest of that. <laughs> but anyway, whatever, you, if you just could put aside all of those things, do you desire to come to Bible college? Would you like to see the things happening to you that you're hearing other people testify about? Well, this is one of the ways that you find God's will. God, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will put his desires in your heart. And that's the way I do things. You know, when we got this property, we started the process. We were out of space down in Colorado Springs. We went to looking, we found a place of uh, I think it was 90 acres in Colorado Springs on the east side of Colorado Springs outside of the city limits and it was for 22 million dollars for 90 acres with no city utilities plus I live 17 miles this direction it would have been an hour and a half two hour drive for me or I'd have had to move and so anyway we were looking at things we had to do something and it's a long story but but the Lord just gave us this. It had come down from, I think it started at 12 million to 4 million with a $3 million lodge on it for 157 acres. And you know what, when I saw this, I desired it. I never heard a word from God, thus saith the Lord, buy this property. I just compared it to that flat land out on Western Kansas out there and looked at this and I thought, you know what? I like it. And I got it because I liked it. I desired it. And you ought to go to our website and look. There was a man, Gilbert Jackson, who used to own this property, his children, the little stars. Anyway, he got born again on June the 22nd, 1993. And the next day he felt bad about how he had never given his life to the Lord, never done anything. And he dedicated this 157 acres to the Lord for Christian education and had a vision of buildings with glass all along the south side so that people could watch Pikes Peak. I didn't know any of that stuff. And on the other side of the world, I was in uh, England on that exact same day that he got born again and dedicated this property to the Lord and saw the vision. And God told me that time, uh, June the 23rd in England at that meeting to start a Bible college. And so, what was it, 16, 17 years after we started the Bible College, we finally bought this place. I didn't know about his vision, and I built this, and it turns out it was in the heart of God, and I know that this is what God had planned. It's been confirmed a million times over, and you know what? I never had a specific word from God. I just had a desire. God led me by my desires, and it's panned out. It works. I know some people are afraid. Well, I can't just follow the desires of my heart. The key to it is, are you truly delighting yourself in the Lord? If you aren't seeking God with your whole heart, you can't go by your desires. But if you are totally committed to the Lord, as it said over in Romans 12, 1, you make yourself a living sacrifice and you renew your mind, you will prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So it really just comes down to you need to be totally committed to the Lord. And if you're committed to the Lord, then what is it that you want to do? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you wanting to do something? Don't let circumstances and obstacles and things hold you back. Follow those desires. Some of you have got desires to, you know, take risks, start a business, do something. And yet you've been afraid to do it because you feel like I've got to provide for my family. I've got to be responsible. I tell you, this isn't a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. We're burning daylight every day. And every day that you aren't pursuing what God created you to be is a day that you've wasted. And you need to find out what God's purpose is and head in that direction. And one of the ways he leads you is through your desires. And then the last thing I wanted to say is another thing that you can tell whether you're doing what God wants you to do is because there is a supernatural, godly satisfaction when you're doing what God calls you to do. 
that you can't get any other way. There are a lot of people who really do love God and they really do want to make their life count. But they aren't doing what God called them to do. And because of it, even if you gain a certain amount of success, you aren't going to have the fulfillment that you would have knowing that you are in the right place doing what God called you to do. I could give you a million examples of that, but I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I have a partner there. He just died uh, two weeks ago, but he had a business, and I used to always go to his business for 20 years or something, and I would speak to his employees. And one year, I, after I got through speaking to his employees, I came out, and there was a lady who was a receptionist. She was an Oriental uh, lady, and she wasn't back there with the rest of the employees. And so. I started talking to her and I said, uh, I noticed you weren't back there. Who are you? So she told me and she said she was the new employee and they hired her to keep answering the phones while everybody else was back there. And she said, uh, what were they doing back there? And I said, well, I was sharing with them. She says, what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And boy, her eyes got big and she said, for who? And I said, for Jesus. And she says, you're the one. And I said, I'm the one what? And she told me that she was a Buddhist and the night before this, she was at home and she was going through whatever ritual it is and she had incense going and she was doing all this and she just stopped in the middle of it and she says, God, I know that there is a God. I know that you exist, but I can't believe that this is it. Would you please reveal yourself to me? Who are you? And she said within just a few moments, there was this ball of light in front of her and it was just pulsating. And she heard an audible voice say, I'm going to send you a man tomorrow who will tell you who I am. And she says, you must be the man. And I said, I am the man. And I told her about Jesus. I got her born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that was great. But you know what the best part of it was? I went out and sat in my car and I couldn't even start the car for a while. I just sat there thinking, God, I was in the right place at the right time. I was in the center of God's will and that was worth more to me than if you'd have given me a million dollars. And there are some of you that have never felt that kind of thing, that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'm doing what I was created to do. And I tell you, if you try and put a round peg in a square hole, it's just not going to fit. There's going to be problems. Some of you are experiencing difficulties because you aren't doing what God called you to do. And even though you may succeed to a degree and you may be a good person and all of that, I'm telling you, there is something that God created you for and you are never going to have total satisfaction, the total peace of God until you do what God called you to do. You know, Adam, when we were singing this morning, he gave a prophecy along these lines. I forget now the exact words, but it was something about you are righteous in all your ways. Isn't that what the phrase was? And he says, it's not your ways, it's his ways. We've got to find his ways. We've got to follow his ways. And that's the way that things work. God, you know, the blessing of the Lord is flowing through me and things are happening because I'm doing what God called me to do. But if I start doing my own thing, you know what? If I have an Ishmael, I got to feed him. If you don't understand what I just said, you need to read the book. But if you're doing your own thing, God will still love you, but he's not going to support your own thing. He created you for a purpose. He's got a design for your life. And for you to have the supernatural satisfaction and peace and joy you need to find out what God created you for and do it. And you know, just coming to Bible college, that, that's one step. The Bible says you'll prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The will of God doesn't just come all at once. It comes in steps and stages. If the Lord was to show you everything that he had planned for your life all at once, it would either overwhelm you, it'd be so far beyond you and your ability that you'd be intimidated, fearful, you'd run the other direction. Or you would become so impatient that you wouldn't grow and, and be faithful through all of the steps and stages and you'd want to skip everything and get right to the end and you'd mess the whole thing up. 
So the Lord will just show you things step by step. And it could be that the next step in God's direction for you is to come to Bible college. But we have a lot of people that they know that this is what God has called them to do, but they don't know what the end result is going to be. But you sit under the word for two years, three years, listening to the word, and it just supernaturally changes you. You know, it's like if you take one of these, I think it's ants, and you just take a regular worker ant. Is it an ant or a bee? It's one of those insects. And you just take a normal worker ant, and feed it royal jelly, and it'll become the queen of the... It's the bee. It's the bee, then. So it'll, it'll... And it's because of the diet that it's fed. It's just any... You can take any worker uh, bee and feed it this royal jelly, and it comes out the queen of the hive. And that's what happens. You come and you sit under the Word of God, and it doesn't matter if you've ever felt like you were leadership material or God had anything special, you sit under the word of God, it'll transform you. And I guarantee you, you come out the other end of this, a transformed person. And I could give you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of people that came in here struggling. And when they leave, they're just powerful and God's got them vision. We've got Cindy Pearson's over in Hong Kong now. And through her, we've now got 50,000 uh, Chinese pastors that get my devotions on a daily basis translated into Mandarin. We've got people in Uganda. We've met with the president and the first lady and they have given us carte blanche to do whatever we can. And we are reaching millions of people. We're reaching 1.8 million people in Karamoja region that used to just uh, kill people and eat people just a few years ago. I actually met a girl who her and her friends were walking through this exact place just five or six years ago, and the rebels came up and killed her friend and ate her right in front of her. And then they tried to kill her. They cut this fatty part of the under part of her arm off and ate it, and it was bitter. And so they just cut a leg off and threw her in the ditch, and she happened to survive. That happened about six or seven years ago in the place that we are now drilling water wells and establishing schools and doing things and we're reaching those people and you know what it's because people came into here the guy who started that stuff in uganda used to be the curator of art for the dallas uh, art museum and he was at a thing fundraiser and he ate a sandwich and choked on it and nearly died they had to rush him to the hospital and while he was unconscious the lord just spoke to him and he says is this all your life is about and he made a decision right then that he was going to devote the rest of his life to the Lord. And he quit uh, the Dallas Museum of Art, came here, got fired up, went to Uganda. And we have, we've now got over half a million people a week going through our discipleship classes in Uganda. And miracles are happening. We've seen multiple people raised from the dead over there. We got Ricky Burge who's over there right now. And man, this guy was on the streets of, what, New York or... Chicago and he was a drug dealer and a drug deal went bad and they nearly killed him They beat him mostly to death took his gun took all of his paraphernalia left him uh, for dead and He somehow or another survived came to Bible college now He's in Uganda and he's reaching millions of people for the Lord just doing an awesome job and we could go on and on and on We got people just like that sitting right here in this room and you don't know it because all you've ever done is just do things through your own ability and power. But I tell you, if you'd come here, God's plans for you are awesome. God's never made a piece of junk. God's never made a failure. God's never made anybody to be normal. What this world calls normal is abnormal. God created us to be something awesome. He created Adam and Eve to rule and to reign. He told them to have dominion and rule and subdue. God never created anybody to just barely get by. He's created you for something great, but you aren't going to know it until you start responding. And I tell you, the Word of God, I've got a series entitled Effortless Change. The Word of God, it, if you just take it, it will change you effortlessly. You cannot remain the same sitting under the true gospel of the Lord Jesus. So tonight, I'm asking you to just evaluate yourself. This is not for the purpose of condemnation, but you know what? You won't change until you realize that something needs to change. As long as you can put up with being sick and tired, you will be sick and tired. 
But when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, then you can change. As long as you can put up with the status quo, it'll stay that way. You have to get a holy dissatisfaction and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to make my life count. If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. You need to believe God. And we've seen Karis Bible College be a major tool, vehicle for God changing people's lives. So I want to encourage you with that tonight. You know, I'd just like to ask you, and again, there's no, I'm not asking you to do anything um, for me, but I'm saying before the Lord, the Bible says faith without works is dead. And if God has spoken to you through this tonight, and if you realize, you know what, I don't know that I've found God's will. Maybe you have, but you don't know that you have. You're just on autopilot hoping that you will wind up at the right destination, but you don't have any, you don't have any control over it. You aren't making choices. If God spoke to you tonight and if you say, you know what, that's me, and I need to find out what God's will for my life is, and I'm, I'm going to make a decision right now to not be unwise, but I will find out God's will for my life. I started seeking as a 16-year-old boy, and God revealed it to me. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. You just have to seek. You have to be desired. You have to be sincere about it. And I want to ask you, if you don't know for sure what God's will is, but you are ready now to commit yourself and to find out what it is, I want you to stand, and I'm just going to lead you in a prayer, and we're going to put action to what God has spoken to us, and we're going to start heading in that direction and I believe this will change your life. If that's you, I just want you to stand right where you are and let us pray. Thank you, Jesus. That was a polite golf clap. Let's praise God. These people are making a decision that's going to change their lives. So I'm assuming that everybody else who's seated knows God's will for your life. You may not know the end result, but you know the direction you're pursuing it, you're moving in that direction, right? You know, I'm gonna specifically pray that this won't work if you're seated. Yeah. See, there was a lot of you that were gonna try and bootleg this prayer. No, you gotta do something. Humble yourself. And so, there's nothing wrong. Man, if you can't stand in front of people who will clap for you and stuff like that, you'll never make it when you're out there among people who don't honor the Lord the way that you do. You, you need to just make a commitment. This isn't too hard. I'm just asking you to stand up and say, I don't know for sure what God's will is, but I want to know. And so we're going to pray this prayer, and I believe that God's going to begin that process in your life. Amen. You'll notice that some of our Karis Bible College students and stuff are still standing. Again, just because you start in this process, you don't ever get it nailed. You just move in that direction. I can say that I'm doing exactly what God called me to do, but I'm not through. He's showing new things to me all of the time. My dreams are bigger than I've told anybody because what I'm telling them is scaring them. So I'm just giving it out piece by piece. But you know what? I'm still learning. I'm still growing. Father, I thank you for all of these people who've stood and have acknowledged that, Father, we don't know for certain exactly what you created us to be. Even when we were in our mother's womb, you had a purpose for us. We want to know what that purpose is. And we don't want to fulfill part of it, Father. We want to fulfill everything. We want to see your perfect will. We want, Father, when we come to the end of our life, not to have anything left in us, that we give every single thing we had, we delivered every miracle, everything that you had planned for our life. Father, we want to deliver it to other people and be used of you. So, Father, we make ourselves, like Romans 12, 1 says, we make ourselves a living sacrifice right now. We lay ourselves on the altar and we ask for the fire of God to fall upon these sacrifices. Father, we can't do it by ourselves. We need your Holy Spirit to come and just light a fire on the inside of us that will give us a holy dissatisfaction for being normal. That, Father, it'll drive us forward. We're asking for this. We believe that you are going to keep 
the things that we're committing right now and bring it back to our remembrance. Father, I know that some of these people will have other things to do, but for those that you are calling here to Karis, Father, I pray that you help them to make that decision, to make a commitment and to just step out and begin the process. And Father, not seek like water the lowest level and just the easiest route, but Father, we would pursue your will regardless of what the consequences are, regardless of what the kickback may be from other people or from things. Father, we believe that your blessing is where you called us to go. And we move towards that. Father, we make a commitment right now. And I believe that you are faithful and just to keep that which we commit. So I just thank you that right now, a miracle is taking place in the life of all of these people. That Father, something supernatural is starting. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you in advance for this is the way, for, for the way that this will change lives. That, Father, we'll never be the same. That we'll begin to reach our full potential. That we will get revelation from you. We thank you, and Father, we just praise you. Believe that not only are...